Hi, I'm Junior from Junior Tune, and today we're going to talk about dyno tuning and the importance of tuner builder relationships. A brief history on myself uh, I've been tuning Subarus for about 15 years now. Uh, I personally own the world's highest horsepower four cylinder Subaru. I've driven some of the fastest Subarus, I've gone 860s on a manual transmission Subaru. I've been part of most of the big four cylinder Subarus in the United States from tuning. The PNL car, which was the fastest for a long time, 830s and a quarter mile, six, seven years ago. Uh, the first six speed car to go eights in the US, factory six speed, stuff like that. The ECU pretty much controls everything the car's doing while you're driving it. Uh, boost control, ignition, I mean, the throttle on the, the newer cars, you have a uh, drive-by wire, so it's controlling throttle input, you know, torque output, ev everything. Uh, you're controlling now the end of injection, cam angle based on end of injection, so there's, there's a, a lot more into it now than it was when it was just fuel and timing and you know, sending it on its way. It's, that's gone. Direct injection definitely made it more complicated. Uh, and it's also made it uh, not really perform as well as the older cars. It makes it a little harder to get the cars to, to make power. Uh, you're limited by fuel supply. Um, no one really makes aftermarket direct injection pumps for uh, Subarus, direct injectors for Subarus. I mean, they're, they're on the way, but even then I think the output's gonna be very limited by those pumps anyway, and they're super expensive. In terms of performance, I think it was a step backwards, but that's just my opinion at this point. So basically like a factory ECU reflash is what we do with the Cobb stuff. Um, you're basically rewriting what's already there, you know, modifying it, making the car perform with the uh, additional upgrades you've put on it. Uh, piggyback we don't even mess with anymore because it's kind of difficult when you have a factory OEM computer fighting everything you're doing. You're not going to get very far, at least not with a newer car. Too many variables in the ECU. Uh, full standalones, I mean, it's a full standalone. You're basically in control of everything and you don't have anything telling you you can't do this or you can't do that. There's no limits to what you're going to do with that ECU. I uh, mainly work with Cobb access ports and pro tuning, um, all the platforms they support. I do standalone stuff as well, this is GTR and you know the other stuff around here. But uh, the majority of my work is Cobb and factory ECU reflashing. Uh, Cobb supports multiple platforms at this point. Um, the software I'd, is not free. You know, for pro tuners, you're paying a subscri subscription to use the software on a monthly basis. Um, the end user can buy an access port and also get um, free software, but they do have to go through some training before they can do that at this point. Um, as far as standalones, they come with software. You, you buy the ECU, it comes with the, the software. Good luck learning it if you've never messed with it. Uh, it's, it's gonna take you a while and you're probably gonna blow up a bunch of cars or your own car, hopefully your own car, a bunch of times before you actually get it right. So Cobb provides you with a handheld uh, that connects to the OBD port. And from there, it lets you flash in base maps that they've already provided with the, the actual handheld for your platform. Um, outside of that, I mean, you can do add-ons like FlexFuel for some of the platforms. They provide injector support, uh, usually injector dynamics slash Cobb uh, injectors, boost solenoids, downpipes. They, they make a pretty decent wide range of uh, parts, aftermarket support for the platforms they support. In terms of, of safety, if you're gonna try and do it yourself, read, read lots. I don't, forums are, you get, a, you get some really bad information, but you can get some good information out of them. You kinda just wanna read. I mean, I wouldn't touch a modern car until I'm very, very comfortable navigating the software and knowing more or less how uh, the ECU is gonna work with the changes I'm making to it. 
you kind of just can't jump into it. You're going to blow it up. You're not going to break it if you understand how it works to begin with. The, the customer brings you the car with his goal. Usually they're street cars, primarily what we do. Um, and you want to blend power with reliability and make sure that you're not giving them a ticking time bomb to get them 10 extra horsepower on the dyno. You give them something that's going to have repeatable power and, and be reliable. You know, give them, instead of lasting a month, maybe a couple of years of, of before they have to upgrade it again. The car that we just had on dyno, I had previously tuned last year. Um, everything was fine. He was having boost creep the minute it got colder. The car was reaching boost targets that we weren't able to lower. It's a mechanical issue with them. It will run more boost than you're telling it to run. And because of the factory fuel system, it maxes out the injectors, fuel pumps. So you end up having to upgrade those parts, do the external wastegate to kind of keep the boost in check. So he had been actually trying to tune it himself for the last two months and it, he quit. It's easier to quit before you blow it up than blow it up and have to spend thousands to rebuild it. So he brought it back to get it fixed up. And uh, basically he road races the car and autocrosses it. So just kept that in mind and developed a safe calibration for him so he can get some enjoyment out of the car for this coming season. I mean, the colder it gets, uh, the denser the air gets and uh, the turbocharger literally just over boosts. It continues to make boosts when you're telling it not to. When it's denser and colder, you, you want to have more flow and you're limited with the factory wastegate. Too much fuel on a boxer engine, it's a flat motor, ends up cylinder wash. So fuel tends to pull on the bottom of the cylinders, you end up washing away the oil that keeps things lubricated. And uh, it damages the bearings, it damages the pistons. Too little fuel creates a ton of heat, and uh, that just cracks the ring lens, causes detonation. So it causes a, a big spike in cylinder pressure, and usually on Subaru motors, the ring lens just break from all the extra pressure. I tend to pull timing out to keep things, uh, give it a bigger margin of error, so to speak, uh, in case they do get crappy fuel. So you basically you're gonna use ignition to control cylinder pressure. Uh, too little, you're going to make spikes in EG, EGT, which is going to create detonation anyway and high cylinder pressure. Too much, you're going to do the same exact thing again. The shape of your power band can be dictated by ignition, the ignition curve. Uh, the way you're bringing in boost, you could bring it in early, you can bring it in more linear to keep the graph climbing a red line, uh, lower cylinder pressure down low, which tends to make things a little cooler is like exactly cooler as you rev the motor out. Um, yeah, and torque, you, you can control the, the throttle opening angle on these newer cars and get, you can shape the torque curve based off that as well. A good torque curve's, uh, in my opinion, broad. It's not peaky, it's just a nice linear uh, torque curve flat. You don't want a big spike at the, the very start and a huge drop off. You want something that hits and carries nice and smooth to red line. Same thing, horsepower curves, you want something that comes in nice and carries the red line as well. You, you don't want a bunch of low end and then tapering power up top. It makes the car feel slow quicker when you have all this low end and nothing up top. You know, you have a power band between three and 45 or 5,000 RPMs of all this torque and horsepower and the car nose dives. So it gets boring. Subarus and their factory turbochargers do drop off. It's a small turbo. So it runs out of steam, you know, as you rev the thing out, 55, 6,000 RPMs. You can't run any more boost. The thing's naturally tapering. It's just what the turbocharger wants to do at that point. Someone that lives at altitude, the first thing it could do would be move to sea level. I'll get you a little performance gain. A basic stage two car would take me 30, 45 minutes to get everything set up because they're pretty uniform from car to car. At this point, something big, can, you know, a big setup can take me an hour, two hours, five hours. It, it really depends what I'm working with. So we have a load-based dyno, so you kind of don't have to go do the road test stuff. Um, 
I've road tested tons of cars anyway, so you kind of get an idea of what they want to do just to kind of streamline the process. I kind of do it on my own stuff. This way when I get the car on the dyno, it's a quicker, smoother process. No one really wants their car to sit on the dyno for hours, getting its ass kicked. There's a few different type of dynos, all-wheel drive dynos. Uh, dyno jets make a nice all-wheel drive uh, dyno. It's repeatable. You can't mess with the numbers. You know, you, you don't have some guy changing the uh, the weight of the car like you can do on these things and end up with an inflated number, or deflated number. You, you kind of it spits out a number and that's what you get. Um, it's a great dyno. You know, not not a lot of people like them, but. They, they are the most reliable in my opinion. And you have these Mustang dynos, this is what we use. Good dyno, the numbers don't tend to be repeatable. You know, it needs to be calibrated every now and then. You have dyno dynamics, those read, the, in my opinion, the lowest. Uh, very reliable, I mean, I, the one I use down in South Carolina, we've been using for about 10 years at this point. No issues, a little load control problem with it, but that's about it. Spits out low numbers, it's a heartbreaker, so to speak, but the cars run good. It's got a good loading system on it. And then there's mainline hub dynos, it's what T1 and you know, Tony over there uses. That's a great dyno for big horsepower cars. The hub dyno is a direct drive to the, to the wheel itself. Um, when I do a pull, I'm looking at the computer, I'm making sure it's not knocking. Knock is what's gonna break your ring lands, you know, it's detonation. Uh, typically what I'll do is like I'll start the car on a very low boost where I know it's not going to knock or not very prone to knocking and I'll go from there. I'll look at the curve, see where everything is before I start doing any bigger power pulls. So basically when, when I work with Vince, our engine builder here at Prime Motoring, um, it, it's a pretty integral part of what I do because I have faith that he's putting together the motor properly. I'm not going to find any hidden problems. There's, there's no finger pointing when something does go wrong because we both know we brought, you know, our A game to it. And if something did go wrong, we can work together as a team to figure out why it happened so it doesn't happen anymore. Whereas when a guy brings a car that, you know, Joe Schmo who builds Mustangs built his Subaru engine, uh, clearances, what are the bearing clearances? I don't know. Uh, well, what are your piston and wall clearances? I don't know. You get a bunch of I don't knows, so it makes my job harder because now I'm overly cautious and it's taking forever to get the job done. And sometimes the job just doesn't end up right because someone overclearance the bearing or underclearance the bearing, the thing spins a bearing on the dyno. You know, so we try and avoid that by limiting the amount of outside engine build stuff. We deal with specifically, you know, IG performance or PNL and stuff like that. And then Vince, having Vince here is amazing. I, I know what he's doing, I get to see him working, he's meticulous, so I don't have to worry about that sort of stuff.